Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. G'day everybody, Steve Waters and Victor Kumar back for another episode, fortnightly episode of Property Investing Insights. Uh, once again with Victor Kumar and Steve Waters and Vic. That would be you, Steve. It would be me and, and you would be you. And I just had to think what <laughs> what the the title was because we just added a word in there yep. uh, just to, I guess, make it more pertinent mm. to what the subject yep. is, see if anybody can figure it out. But nonetheless, fortnightly session, this mm-hmm. time without Phil. Uh, he's every other week. Yeah, so we'll have some real meat today. Yeah, so this one should be far better uh, <laughs> than when he's on board with us steering uh, the topic and steering the conversation. But Vic, once again, I know we say this every single time, but so much has happened uh, since our last recording on the last fortnight. And whilst I say that, it's always ever changing. Mm-hmm. But there are some big ticket, I guess is one way to describe it, some big ticket changes, nuances yep. uh, throughout the entire industry, the entire sector uh, that is starting to shape the next five years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I really think that, you know, I- I- if people grab onto and, and actually um, look at how these changes are going to impact them in terms of financial capability and capacity, uh, they'll have huge dividends uh, down the track, right? It's it's no different to where when you talk to people that have invested in the yesteryears where they had seen changes similar to this, but this is, this is like, this is the perfect storm that's coming up, but changes similar to this, they got the big time dividends because they were taking, uh, they were taking uh, action assertively, taking into account the changes that are happening and how it's, it's rating back to them. It's such an important point because when we talk to clients or you know, other peers that have, I guess, had, 20 or so years mm. of, of investing and some even further. And we asked them what were the most profitable, pivotable times looking back that 20 odd years, it's always been at the back end of a perceived crisis. Yes. doesn't necessarily have to be a truthful one, but mm-hmm. if it's perceived, um, it can make all the difference. And we could go back as, <clears throat> as recent as the beginning of COVID. Mm-hmm. We could go back to APRA. Yeah, we could go back to the end of the GFC and mm-hmm. during. We could go back to the end of the low dock loan and so on and so mm-hmm. forth. Right. So there's so many, there's so many instances where, and so many data points, points, and so much proof to show that those who acted at a point in time mm-hmm. do far better than those who, I guess, ride the tail end of a market cycle. Now, yep. just to put a bit of a caveat around that market cycle commentary. Very rarely do you get an entire country moving in the same direction Mm -hmm. in terms of a market cycle. Usually, you know, one's up, one's down, one's sideways. And over the last, I guess, couple of uh, upward trends or bullish markets, a lot of the country, if not all of it, has been the recipient of of growth. Now, we don't suggest that that's going to be the case now at all. Uh, We think that it'll be a very segmented market and some will outperform others and some won't do very much. Yeah at all um but it's at these it's as as these all of these components come together and as you said it's the perfect storm and the negative for some and it's the, it's a perfect opportunity for others absolutely and 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 the reason why we say it's negative is that if you don't play this right you will get financially hurt right no, not necessarily just in dollar terms but lost opportunity terms as well because if you talk to any investor that has been around for decades the key thing that the key message that they'll always give you is wish i had gone harder wish i had gone a lot earlier in terms of getting started and then also wish i had not taken into account all of this negative sentiment that was around yeah the shoulda woulda coulda Mm. phenomenon yeah phenomenon you know, I've never been able to say that <laughs> word. I don't, I don't know what it is. I just can't wrap my, my tongue around it. And so, Vic, today's subject, I think, would be, it, which I think is going to be a very good one, and it could put a few people's noses out of joint. Mm-hmm. There'll be some, I guess, <clears throat> hate mail associated with it. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's the 
absolute bare bones truth. And that is, you need to understand that the tempo of the market is against you. Mm. Unless, and that's the big question mark, yep. unless. So the tempo of the market is against you. There's just no, there's no other way to look at it for most of the country. Now, I guess, the, and before we do a bit of a market update, I'll just give a bit of an explanation, I guess, <clears throat> around the subject of the tempo of the market is against you. It's not just the tempo of the asset class that I'm talking about here. It's mm. also the, the tempo of finance yep. and its hurdles. Mm. It's the tempo of how quick you need to learn mm. to skill up. Yep. And how quick you need to make decisions. And how quick you need to act. Mm. Now, and, that, and that in itself can be quite challenging for some. Yeah. Um, people would wrap that up, I guess, with the word procrastination mm, mm. At, at time, which is quite natural, yeah. Like, yeah. If I, and I've said this before. I've, for me to buy a property is like one point two seconds, mm. but I do it every day. Mm-hmm. For me to buy a laptop, it's a year process. Isn't that a saga? It well, it is. <laughs> You've got no idea. So when you're talking about, and so this is why I understand a lot of people's conundrum because if it takes me a year to buy a couple of thousand dollar laptop or whatever it may be. Imagine the emotive roller coaster mm-hmm. of trying to spend half a million, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars with a lack of education, yep. a lack of a team, uh, and not a lot of foresight. Absolutely. And I think the key thing here is that people are afraid to make decisions. They don't know what decisions to make because there's so many uh, different aspects and moving parts that we need to look at in this one transaction, right? <coughs> and they're looking at, okay, have I got it right? Have I, have I, have I uh, got the area right? Am I buying the right type of property? Or um, the, 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 the worst thing someone can do, now again, I want to qualify this you need to still be buying within your means, right? There's, there's no sense buying properties that you cannot afford. But in a market like this, the worst thing someone can do is say, the market's too hot, I'll sit it out, right? I'll sit it out. It's just a matter of adjusting what you're buying and adjusting your decision-making process. So, you know, moving at the speed of knots uh, as opposed to still operating off the handbook of a slow market and say, I've got two days, three days to make a decision. Hundred percent. You pretty much got hours. In a lot of cases, mm. y- you do. It, um, and so that's why we thought we'd talk about this today. Is just to make everybody aware that this is not a, I guess the way to, to phrase it, this isn't a buyer's market. No. Vic, a little bit of interesting thing before we get back to uh, what we were talking about. We just had a moment, ladies and gentlemen, and the moment was in the first time in history of doing this podcast for some five years six years now six years we just had to do a an edit retake yeah an edit yeah now to be fair the edit or the 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 necessity of the edit was not our fault Mm. someone's phone went off with a voice reminder through our earphones and it (laughs) threw us all (laughs) you should have seen steve's face i nearly went through the roof i thought it was mine but anyways so what we were talking about so first edit ever so what we were talking about is the tempo of market is 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 against you and there are several components towards that and it's not a one market component Mm. where everything is against you because of the tempo there were some areas where there is a lack of lack of tempo but the good fundamental producing uh data correct areas i don't want to say the word hot but they're extremely buoyant buoyant Mm. is is the way to go now some people describe that as a hot spot Mm. i'm not a fan of Labeling I things. I don't even like the word hotspot. Right? No, it just gives you that wrong impression of you know have to buy in that area. Yeah, and it 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 just I think it can become a self fulfilling prophecy for a very short term. Mm. Um, if anything, I'd, I'm more about not spots. Yeah, uh, but that can that could perhaps be a a different uh, a different podcast. But the reason that the market is is so buoyant in these good areas is because the depth of buyers is very, very deep. Mm, mm. The stock on market is very, very low. These are just headline headline commentary uh, or factors. And why it's so important to recognise this is because of the way that you negotiate, I'll come back a step, I'll back the truck up, the way that you assess, then the way that you negotiate, and then the way that you execute mm. is so bloody important yep. because if there's a moment of hesitation for all the wrong reasons the deal is gone yeah. and you'll probably be paying more 
tomorrow. Mm. Well, we're seeing that, right? So uh, when we bought properties and we go back into that area, so eight weeks later, uh, we are already seeing a big price jump in, in most of the areas, right? And, and that's not just because we bought so well. It's also because of the way the market, the tempo is, is moving and the fact that um, the investors that um, have a little bit of clue around them they know what's coming, right? And so they're jumping and they don't mind paying the 10, 20, 30K extra. Not that we would advocate for that, but they're paying above just to knock out the competition. In fact, we've done this in the past where, if you recall, Steve, um, we were buying, you know, we're buying a block of units in Wollongong. I remember that. And yeah. uh, we were in a competition, and this was our personal, personal uh, portfolio. Uh, we were in competition with another very well-renowned, uh, well-connected buyer's agent and just to mess up with the with his head and also to uh, as part of negotiating tactic we offered uh, at that time which was unheard of 30k above listed price and we got the property right uh, now obviously we done reverse engineered our figures to make sure that we you know we're not really overpaying on it but this is where the market is today where the list price is now irrelevant such an important point mm. <coughs> i want to say that again the list price is irrelevant, it's an indication. Yep. Now, if you go back, I don't know, it might be last year, the year before, or halfway through COVID uh, for the listener, and, and remember when Vic and I were talking about uh, yeah, doing diligence on a property, how do you, how do you confirm value? Mm. And one of the things that we said is that the listing price means nothing, it's yep. an indicator. Mm. Now, if we use the block of units that we bought down in Wollongong as your example, and paying 30,000 over uh, over asking mm. price. Now this this is about seven, uh, 15 years ago. I know, right, a yeah. long time ago. Um, sure, Shvik, that just shows <laughs> our age. But we started uh, buying property when we were seven. I like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you can't do that anymore. Um, but our research, and remember that's what we do every day, actually showed that they were probably in the vicinity of sixty to seventy thousand dollars per unit mm. more than the thirty thousand in entirety mm, that yep. we paid for the block over list price. Right now, why? This comes down to diligence and the way that you negotiate. Because negotiating is not just about research on the asset, it's about research on the sales agent. Mm. And if you can, and the, the vendor. vendor. Yeah. Um, so in that, that particular circumstance, the vendor had purpose built these many moons ago, mm. didn't really know what the value of it was. And the reason he didn't know the value was because he was using his friend who was an out of town agent. Mm -hmm. And I mean, way out of town in terms of that locality. And it was just wanting a easy, smooth transaction. And when we offered over the asking price, psychologically, that hurt mm -hmm. the other the other buyer's agent. But once again, if it wasn't worth that, we wouldn't have done it. No. And actually, conversely, I remember we bought a property in regional Queensland that was on the market. This is going way back even before this. We bought a property that was on the market for $210,000 for $110,000. Mm -hmm. Now, on the surface, that would make us the world's best buyer's agent if you just looked at the difference, right? Yeah, but it was never worth two hundred. But it was never worth $210,000. Yeah. Mm. And it's actually, as I think that, it shows you how data can be mm. misleading, misleading. Yeah. unless you know the truth mm -hmm. behind it. So the way that you negotiate in, in today's market is very, very different from what it was eight months mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. which is different from what it was 18 months ago yep. and so on. So when you're negotiating, it's you could nearly break it down into price terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. So when it's a buyer's market, you could nearly have it all. Yep. Price, you can have the terms, in mm -hmm. other words, dictating, well, I want an extended settlement or I want a longer cooling off or I want early access, you know, whatever it may be, when it's a buyer's market. But when it's let's call it a seller's market, just to go the extreme opposite. The more you complicate your offer, the less attractive the, it is. The less attractive yeah. it is compared to everybody mm -hmm. else. So terms and conditions over and above what is normal becomes a hurdle yep. to the real estate agent and it becomes a hurdle mm. to the seller. Obviously price does as well. So if it's on the market at 700,000 and you're offering 500, you, you haven't got a snowball's chance in hell, but you're also probably damaging your relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that I, I, I wrote an ebook way, way back, right, and it's on our website. And um, I, we, we had to actually go back and edit and take a paragraph out of it because it was no longer relevant, right? So when I wrote it, it was just after the GFC. And, and um, I said in there, you know, just offer 20% below asking price. That's your starting point, right? Yeah. Numbers game. Yeah. Now I think it's the other way around. Can be. Yeah. It, it really, really can be. And let's actually look at that as, a, as an example, the other way around, as you so phrase it. 
So if you had a, let's let's just tick the box and say it's a great area, it's got all the right fundamentals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And property matches you. And the property matches your circumstances mm-hmm. and what you're trying to achieve um, in terms of goals and financial, right? So that's out of the way. And let's say that the property was on the market for $500,000, just for my simplicity maths. And you assess it to be worth $500,000. You think that's a fair and reasonable pr- price in a buoyant market. Mm-hmm. If you complicate the terms of your offer and you lowball with your first offer, so in other words, that we, we refer to that as open extreme in today's market, the time and you're, and you're smashed, it's like, you know, Fendel says no, real estate agent says no, be gone with you. In fact, I probably don't want to talk to you again because you've wasted my time. Mm-hmm. And so you find the next opportunity and you start to compare it to your last offer Yep. potential opportunity that you are negotiating, but the market has moved. And that mm-hmm. could be the space within the space of Weeks. a week. Mm. Now, most people would argue against us on that saying, well, the market can move in a, in a week. There is a, in a very buoyant market, just for people to understand, there is a, there is, the, the tempo can change very, very quickly, both up and, up and down, depending on stock on market. Mm-hmm. And so I'll give you an example of say, let's say just Perth as an example today, right? And having a uh, having our daily meeting with our buyers agents over in Perth, and you and I were both over there a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago, or four weeks ago, and the feedback that we're getting is that you could go on to real estate to com t- today, pick a good suburb, and there might be fourteen properties for sale in the entire suburb. Yep, which is extremely low. Mm. Right, but then as you sift through those properties on the dot com platforms, out of that fourteen for sale. 12 of them are already un- sold are under offer mm. so they're still on the website as a lead magnet for the particular real mm-hmm. estate agents and maybe some particular vendors so instead of there being 14 in a market for sale in a suburb there's two mm. so you can see how the the data just changes yeah immediately right so if you're trying to buy in that market what does it come down to relationships with the mm-hmm. agent physically being the squeaky wheel introducing yourself communicating trying to get pre-market mm. uh, opportunities. And minimizing your conditions. Minimizing your conditions, minimizing the complexity of your offer, and then executing mm-hmm. without firthing yep. around. So whether you want to say, well, that's a kind of, I'm still doing my diligence sort of sets, mm. so to speak. Got to move you, faster. You've got to, you've got to be quicker. Yep. You've got to do your diligence quicker. You've got to be at a, at a point in time where you are happy to execute when the right opportunity mm. Uh, presents itself yep. rather than well hang on stop the bus you know you've accepted my office let me just do a little bit more diligence mm. you should be before that yeah otherwise words, yeah. you'll lose that you'll lose the opportunity and you'll pay more in a fortnight's time yeah absolutely so in other words you need to be the expert in that area absolute expert from both price and type of property wise uh, and, and that then gives you the decision making points to execute really fast right now if you're spending three weeks to then research an area uh, and, and and by the time you're ready to execute and p- start putting in offers, the market's already moved. And you nearly have to start the diligence yep. phase again or the mm. education phase again. Yeah. Now, that, just to be clear though, listeners, it's not just about the way that you present an offer, establishing value, um, how to assess an area. It's also about yourselves mm. personally, knowing what your budgets are, knowing what your capital are. And I'll give you an example. Um, which we spoke, I spoke to a, a client the other day and they had a borrowing capacity up to a million dollars but they only had a circa, I think it was $180,000 in capital. Yep. The capital doesn't match the, the loan bo- capacity, the, yep. the borrowing capacity. Mm-hmm. So whilst it's great to have that excess potential, you need to reverse engineer the numbers to know mm-hmm. that what you can actually spend. And, yep. it, and just as a side note, there's nothing wrong with being over-approved. Mm. It doesn't cost you anything. In fact, it could even open you up to more opportunities. But just make sure that you know your own personal circumstances mm-hmm. as much as you know the properties and the, the, the areas and all the other data points that you need to cross the T's and dot the I's with. Yeah. So if you look at it, right, so when you're buying a property, there's, there's a couple of things we need to look at, right? So one is finance, right? The second is obviously the type of property you're buying, what you're buying, where you're buying. Um, a, a, and then the third is uh, the ongoing work that's required on the property, right? So if you come back to finance, <coughs> you've got three components there. You've got the finance approval, wh- how much the bank's willing to lend you. 
then the next facet of it is how much capital you've got so that you've still got some gunpowder left once the property settles right because murphy's law is that day it settles your hot water system goes and there goes another three thousand odd dollars right then the third thing is the cash flow right so how much is this property costing you to hold so that ties back into your finance approval right so as an example if you're buying within your smsf obviously your interest rates a little bit higher so y- y- your cash flow for the property you need to take a very um, informed approach is to to make sure that you're not loading up too much in terms of negative cash flow in there um, the days and time of positive cash flow properties is long gone for the good quality investment grade properties if people do the numbers yep correctly correctly yeah. yeah a lot of people just you know fluff it and say you know what i'm putting in a cash deposit and all the sort of stuff yeah it works in super but you got to look at all of the moving parts right so that's your finance side of it then when you're looking at the area side of it it needs to match into uh, you know what you're trying to achieve in terms of first of all <coughs> the finance sort of dictates where you can go because on that's the top line on yep. the top line right then you need to be looking at it okay um does does my thought process of i want it around the corner from me because i want to drive past it the reality of it is probably won't drive it drive past it more than twice in a lifetime yeah and i want to do work to this property um so if there's a repair or maintenance you know i i can get my uncle down there um sometimes it costs you more mm-hmm. to get your uncle to work on the property or friends yeah uh so th- it, they are the things that you need to look at from from a um uh, property selection point of view and then looking at the other moving parts of the management side of it you know uh, is the lender going to lend you enough money in that area ongoing yeah postcode yeah, check postcode check yep. is the um is the property manager uh, are, are there enough property managers in that area so you have to look at all of those things and once you've ticked them off the decision making process becomes a whole lot more faster right whereas most people what they do is they jump on and say well everyone's buying in 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 Perth or everyone's buying in Sydney so I'm going to jump in here and they start searching for properties before they sorted out all of these other moving parts so when they actually jag a property as such uh, then they're scrambling to make a decision and and uh, innately they know that they have put the cart before the horse right Great and point. that therefore <coughs> it's much harder to make a decision if you've got all of your executing points lined up it's very easy to make decisions yeah and if you go back to my example of buying may buy a property or a or a laptop mm. I, I never have the correct components in front of me in terms of education to make the decision to buy the laptop yep. hence why it takes me because you don't do it every day a year correct yeah. and there's a big part of fomo or maybe not fear of missing out in in my example it's fear of getting it wrong yeah mm. correct what happens if they bring a better model yeah yeah what happens if this what happens mm. what happens if 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 yeah. if if right now that's just a lack of education and mm. me being a control freak yeah my time is far better spent outsourcing it to someone who's techy and yeah go get me a laptop mm. please after y- after he understands what you really need right good point mm. so that's your one great point i don't i don't need to explain that one cuz i would i don't need fumble it anyways <laughs> it's um one of the things you mentioned though vic was and everybody says the same thing in terms of goals mm-hmm. right um and they tie their goals as a top line and then they try to create a strategy mm to get to the goals and there's two there's two parts of that um equation I guess the first one is the strategy is there to bridge the gap from where you are to where you want to be yep right point number 1 point number 2 is that retirement shouldn't be an age mm it should be an equation yep Th- make it quicker mm-hmm. may take a little longer but it's always going to be around the net result the equation mm-hmm. not the time piece. I want to yep. retire when I'm 67, 42, whatever mm-hmm. it is. It's well what's the money situation look like? What's that's what it boils down to, right? Yeah, yeah, you can sugarcoat it any other way. Mm. But at the end of the day, it is the wealth position and the cash flow that enables choice and that choice could be part of I exit the workforce mm-hmm. or I whatever. Yeah. Donate it all. Mm. But retirement is not an age it should be an equation. Yeah. You, you said so, you know something really important here that I want to reiterate is is that you know retirement is about your wealth position and your cash flow. They're two very different things. Very right? different. Yeah. So wealth position would be your equity position. Yeah. Not necessarily the number of properties in that sense but the equity position which you know really you can't um you can't spend your wealth, right? You you can 
hand it down, but you can't spend it. What you really can spend is the lifestyle side of it, which is the cash flow side of it, which you mean, which comes back to the unencumbered rent. Um, I'm not talking, you know, buying 200 properties at $20 each positive cash flow per week. That That's insanity. That's right? ridiculous. We need to minimize the number of properties, but still have enough diversification uh, without over... Um, over leveraging and, and get drowning in debt in case <coughs> the interest rates go against you. And we need to also be comfortable that you may carry some debt into retirement, right? It, not all of the loans may be paid off. And we need to then take an educated approach to say, well, you know, this is where retirement looks like to me and it could be a phased uh, process where you're cutting back one day, cutting back two days and, uh, you know, is, is that unfolds as the cash flow starts flowing in, you now have a choice. And and the reality of it is, most people that I've spoken with that, that um, in inverted commas have retired, they're busier than ever. Yeah, 100%. Mm. It, it's, I, I don't think I could retire as no. in sit on a beach and go fishing. Yep. I mean, I'd love the... The, the, <laughs> the novelty of it would wear, very wear off yep. very quickly. And I'm not a very good fisherman, even though I love it. it um, but that... that gap I guess those years prior to retirement mm. and just into retirement we refer to that as the transition yep. into retirement so it's usually a good 10 years mm. beforehand mm. where your team players such as your fin planner potentially certainly your accountant and your advisors should be collectively speaking and putting the pieces in place for that transitional yep. piece which is circa 10 years or or thereabouts yes you can start the accumulation of assets and cash flow well beforehand but there's some pivotal moving pieces in terms of structure and timings mm. so that you can do it in a far safer effective manner mm. that transition but that's the the end goal mm. sorry steve I, I have to interrupt over here a lot of people you know talk about buying properties buying you know getting to retirement and they expect something magical to happen in the end to unencumber the cash flow and get rid of the debt right there is a process to it Correct, hundred percent. There is, and it's it, it can be quite an easy process, mm. which once again revolves around timing, both per- personally and the markets and the the economy. But you've got to have a you've got to have a roadmap. Yeah, you've got to have a directional piece. If you just fumble your way through it, yeah, you might get lucky. Mm. And doing something without a plan is better than doing nothing. Yep. without a plan yeah. or a goal. Yeah, um, and, and that brings us back to today. There's a lot of people that are sitting on the sidelines for two reasons. One is they want to do something, but they don't have the capacity thanks to finance. Mm-hmm. Right? But then there's also, I would suggest, a large cohort of people that are just sitting and waiting. Mm. You know, just say, well, I'm just going to see how things pan out yeah. before I take a leap. Like, I don't think you could get much more evidence no, no. Like than what we have right now yeah. to activate. And I don't want to sound you know, too bullish or too buoyant or whatever. Um, I will say, however, that we've both been doing this for decades mm. and history leaves evidence. History yep. leaves a pattern. Very strong clues. Yeah. Mm. And it doesn't mean that every, uh, I guess, crisis or, or market factors are identical to the last and nor will the result be. But there are certain pieces of the puzzle that just say activate. Mm. And then when you get the puzzle that has all of the pieces just about you need to be, this comes back to the tempo of the market and how quick you can react to opportunities. Yep. You need to educate yourself, you need your ducks lined up, you need to be sure, and then you need to execute. Mm. If you can't, then don't. Mm. Sit back, but don't do all the legwork beforehand. Because, I mean, other than, yes, I guess, top line education, but as we get to a micro piece in terms of suburb, suburb location, street location, property type location, or type you're just spinning wheels you're you're actually wasting your time Mm. because the time that you've convinced yourself or educated you enough self enough to actually activate the market has moved substantially and the dynamics are different and perhaps even the fundamentals are Mm. and even perhaps so too is your circumstances so one of the one of the things that that uh, you know having invested for decades and invested in different markets and, and having started from scratch one of the things I was, uh, uh, you know, really uh, cognizant of educating myself is understanding that you don't overpay for a property. 
but you can strategically pay a little bit more to capture the opportunity provided you've looked at what your exit strategy is, what your use of the property is from in terms of how it fits into your portfolio and taking a longer term approach right? Uh, in a buoyant market. Equally importantly, you know, both you and I have bought in a very slow market, in a downward trending market. And um, we've reversed that equation where we have strate- strategically underpaying for a property in, in that sense right now. Again, we're talking from a listed price point of view, right? Uh, the property is worth what it is worth at the end of the day, mm-hmm. right? And, and uh, um, a really good example of of um, you know very strong markets, very fast moving market is how the valuers are unable to keep up with the values of the properties, right? Because they need settled sales in play to compare, whereas if the sales of say in the last say six weeks, eight weeks that's not hit the data uh, as yet, they can't use that for comparable. And often they may be a little bit out of step if they're out of area themselves, right? Because Correct. you can't, this is the time where you really can't use desktop data to dictate what the property is worth. Do you know what, there's, as you said that, there is a time and a place for desktop data or desktop valuations. Mm. Let's, let's go to that. Sometimes desktop valuations that the lenders uh, utilize are advantageous mm. for you. Yep. Sometimes they're, not good for you at all mm-hmm. because you know it's worth a lot more. Just a su- side note, a word of warning to people that do use desktop valuations or the lenders have chosen to and you get this phenomenal valuation, valuation. Yeah. be real. Yep. Right, because if you tap that equity as an example and loose numbers, you know your property's worth $500,000 but you've got a six hundred or a $700,000 valuation because of the data analysis that the modelling does. Mm. Don't over leverage yourself. Don't yep. put yourself into a position where you're taking the equity and being to utilise for whatever, but mm. in real terms being in negative equity. Mm. Now, there are some people out there going, yeah, but I'd do far better with that equity and I know that the property is going to grow and catch itself up and overtalk, overtake that debt position. But that's not everyone. That's not everybody. It mm. takes a, an extremely um, strategic and methodical investor mm. to to make that happen and be be effective. So yep. just, that's just a... A word of warning. And actually on valuations, Vic, some really interesting data came out the other day as we pivot again. It's, um, so Apicologic uh, gave us some numbers in and around the value of residential real estate, which just pipped $10 trillion as That's an asset huge. class. $10 trillion with a T. Dollars. <laughs> right? Now to put that in, to put that in context. Now for those that were that were just listening and not watching the video, Steve's just done uh, mini me. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, watch the video on YouTube. In, it probably won't be funny. You had to be there. It's um, so ten trillion dollars. Vic is the total value of residential real estate. Now to put that in context, total value of superannuation is three and a half mm. trillion dollars. Total value of all listed companies on the share market is $2.9 trillion. And the total value of commercial real estate in Australia is $1.9 trillion. So nothing compares? N- to you. It came to my head. But it, um, it just shows you that residential real estate and being a $10 trillion dollar, valuation and climbing mm. and another podcast will do the debt associated with that and you'll be very surprised everybody on how low the LVR is on yeah. the loan to value ratio is um, so at 10 trillion dollars it shows you the size the enormity uh, and the diversity of the necessity yeah. mm. for the government to keep it going it's it, almost it's got to a point where it's too big to fail yeah it is the favored asset class of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Yeah. Whether it's their owner occupied property, whether it's their wealth creation vehicle, for a lot of good reasons, which mm-hmm. you know, most of us hopefully know, but it just overshadows all other asset classes. And even collectively, if my maths was right, it still doesn't add up mm. yep. to the $10 trillion. And you know what the icing on the cake is? We are undersupplied. I, I know, the, the, <laughs> I know we talk about this every podcast, every Facebook Live, just about every conversation we have with whomever. I don't think the enormity of the current situation, I don't think the majority of people just understand Hmm. 
the enormity of it, like yep. just how much of a crisis we're in. And I see that the government the other day, so, uh, they got a deal with the Greens where their future building fund is mm. now a goer. So the Greens, I guess, capitulated on the rent freeze. Um, I'd imagine that wasn't because of they had this aha moment. They just couldn't get it across the yep. line and they'd still want it, right? Mm. So it looks all but game on mm-hmm. now for that. So if you then throw that into the mix with the 10 trillion odd dollars valuation of the of the asset class, you then throw in the, I guess, the processes and the way that they're going to build these properties. Mm. Go back to our podcast actually we did, which went literally viral, um, I don't know, whatever it was, six months ago around, yeah, the system is broken, check, yeah. checkmate Australia. Mm-hmm. Right, it's... Not only is it, yeah, obviously a lot of our listeners loved it, but we've also got a hell of a lot of conspiracy theorists oh, now yeah. that have <laughs> sort of cottoned onto it, which was never the, the reason for it. But there is there is no way out of this. And, and, and I guess to preface my next statement, you know, I am apolitical. I am more about the policy rather than the party. Mm. But Labor's legacy with what they're doing now is going to go down in the record books. It's yeah. going to go down in history as a moment in time that won't be one of their best moments. Mm. Mm. And, you know, we started this this podcast with saying that, you know, the, the, the tempo of the market is not in your favour, right? But when you take all of this into account and, 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 and play it out longer term, it is absolutely in your favour if you are in a position to take action. Yeah, we, we spoke about this on our Facebook Live last week, I think it was, mm-hmm. the week before. We were saying, well, what, what are the ramifications of the, the Future Housing Fund yeah. in combination with the shared equity scheme being mm-hmm. 40% for... Uh, new. new home and 30% for existing homes. And there's some caveats around that. Um, do your research. But when you put those two pieces together, tell me that construction costs aren't going to increase by whatever. Mm-hmm. Call it 30%. Tell and me that the therefore, cost therefore, the underlying value of the asset will increase. Yeah. yeah. How will that help inflation? Yeah. yeah. Where are they going to get the builders from? Because there's also an argument out there from people saying, well, we should stop immigration because mm. yeah, we don't have enough accommodation for uh-huh. everybody. But... You're damned if you do and you're damned if mm. you don't. My opinion, my, um, and it's just my opinion, is we need immigration. We need them to fill the void in the labour market. Mm-hmm. And if you're not growing, you're dying. Yes. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. The, the bottom line is they should fast track building or supplying accommodation. There's easier ways to do it than what they've said, but yep. you know, far above my pay grade. Get, clearly. Rid, get rid of the red tape. Get rid of the red tape. Yeah, rezone acreage. Hmm. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve and I have got acreage, by the way. <laughs> um, but one of the interesting stats I, I read this morning from I think it was Macro Business uh, or thereabouts, um, no SQM, and my numbers aren't going to be exact, but you'll get the the gist that the entire entire continent, entire Australia, the residential rate still continues to decrease. Mm. And in the entire country, I think there was circa 35,000 properties available yep. for rent. 35,000 properties available for rent. Mm. Now, just hold that thought. Clearly, we're already undersupplied. Then you have immigration. Yep. In excess of that. So there is no way out of this in the short to medium term um, sort of years mm. for mm. me because you can't just flick the switch and supply accommodation. It is a, as you mentioned, a laborious red tape or orientated process yep. and it takes years to get stuff out of the ground into a livable turnkey position. Mm. The immigration will continue to surge. The the crisis will get worse. People's affordability will be stretched. Mm-hmm. And so how do you allow accommodation to get into the market? And uh, the one other point is that the uh, Property Investment Professionals of Australia, so PIPA released their and or their sentiment survey, of which I'm a board member, that was released today, and it showed the numbers of investors uh, at certain points in time over the last, let's say, quarter or six months or whatever it was, who have sold investment properties mm. because it's just all too hard. Yep. Not necessarily the interest rates, mm-hmm. but the... All of this confusing... Yeah, the confusing narrative, the, the impositions that the state government, Labor governments are putting on investors Mm -hmm. all but saying we're going to make it as hard as we can for you. And some of those examples were Queensland State Premier back, whatever it was, 12 months ago Mm -hmm. around rent 
craps, rent caps, rent freezing, um, and just making and the land tax scenario yep. pulling it together. Um, and investors just said, you know what, we out, we're out. Yeah, like as if it's not hard enough already with the current interest rate environment. You've just given us a reason to get out. Mm. Um, Victoria, same thing. Same thing with with Dan Andrews. Mm-hmm. Um, not so much Sydney. But you well, know, Sydney has done a back down in terms of the stamp duties, right? So well, yeah. yeah. I mean, the 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 Liberal state government in New South Wales, I guess, had different thought processes around how they can create accommodation and mm-hmm. you know, sort of squashing any sort of uh, negativity against investors. State this state government, new state government now for circa six months. Yeah, you know, they're a little bit different. Mm. And here and here is the the danger once again. Not I'm apolitical. It. Um, when you've got the entire country under labour mm-hmm. uh, governance, you know, federal and state levels, it makes it really hard, I guess, to... To have check and, check and balances in place, isn't it? Checks and balances mm-hmm. in place, but also this goes back to the, I guess, to the to part of the, the, the topic in and around being able to make a quick, collective, educated decision. Mm. When you've got this peripheral noise... Yep. What if? What if? What if? Mm. You know, it, it just makes it harder. So, my, I guess, my advice to that is control what you can control, mm. and act accordingly. Yep. Yeah. You know, forget the white noise. At and that's what it day. is. At I, the end of that, that's what it is. And it's so easy to be distorted and distracted by white noise because of technology. You know, as we as we've spoken about on many occasions. So that's why I think surrounding yourself with the right people, like-minded people. Uh, having a clear strategy mm. and and an execution plan and keep the blinkers on. Yeah. Keep keep focused. Just look at absolute economics one oh one. If you really want to get down to brass tacks. Yep. And then activate or don't. Mm. But don't spin wheels because you're just wasting your time. Yeah. Choose something else. Yeah, and you, you'll hurt yourself financially if you start doing it that way, right? So uh, it's really important to take into account all of the moving parts. Uh, but also being having the ability to shut out the white noise and make make it um, right down to what's relevant to you and what's not and what you're trying to achieve and uh, a lot of people you know really uh, as a, as a closing remark I think that the question most people ask is where do I buy which is the wrong question right it should be what do I buy can I buy mm. You know, like uh, one of the other questions we get a lot of is, is it a good time? Yeah. It's always a good time. There's always a good time somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. More the question should be, is it a good time for me? Mm. Yeah. More so than, more so than anything. But you mentioned there's a lot of moving parts and what, what we see a lot of new investors. So let's talk, say first time, whether a first time homeowner or a first time investor, one of the major hurdles that people have is the emotive roller coaster of purchasing. So once mm-hmm. you've assessed a situation, once you've assessed a potential opportunity, you've signed a contract and you're in that cooling off period, that's when the emotions really start to to amp up, mm. right? Especially mm. when it's your first time. In fact, I don't care if you're a first time investor or you're a hundred and first time investor, there is always emotion involved. Yep. Different components. And as as I've said before, you may not be emoti- emotionally attached to the asset, but you're emotionally attached to the debt. Mm. And that's the hardest piece to, to get around. But yep. So there's there's so many moving parts from that time that you actually sign contracts to the day that you own it. Mm. And we've measured it. There's 72 steps from the time you put pen to paper on a contract to the day that you own it. Yep. And that's in a very streamlined process. Mm. So with 72 steps, there's a lot can, that can go wrong. Mm. There's a lot that can challenge your thinking. There's a lot that can cha- challenge your emotive state. And so just make sure that you're not only educating yourself what, where and when to purchase, but actually what the price, what's involved. Mm. Because let me tell you, everybody's got their hand out. Yeah. I need a check for this. I need a you know, transaction for, uh, t- transfer amount for this, whether it be the bank, the solicitors, the conveyances, the pest and building inspectors, the property managers, everybody. Mm. It's not just, well, you know, we'll add 5% and that's the, that's the costs yep. to run. Different in each state. It's different in each state. So what, one of the things we do is we actually supply a purchasing assistant or a personal assistant, right? And their job is to micromanage and timeline that and be the hub of all communication mm-hmm. because we understand how many moving 
parts there is, yep. and you can let yourself down. Mm. You, know, you can go to ground. Some, and we've seen that. Like, can't contact them mm -hmm. because you've buried their head in the sand. Yep. You know, you're at the end of the cooling off period. So on and so forth. So it's not just a, well, let's put the effort into the front end. Mm. The effort should be front end, middle, the, the purchasing process, and then equally as important is the back end. Actually, once you own it, how are you going to own it? Yep. How are you going to control the asset? Very important. Mm. We've come to the end. We have. We have. And um, if you wanted to uh, chat with other myself or Steve, whether you're a first-time investor or you have a few properties behind you, um, there is a little bit of a process. Um, obviously, contact us through socials or through our website. Um, and our business manager, Kate, she's a exper very experienced uh, property investor herself. She will make sure that you come. Uh, uh, she, she'll set up a time with either myself or Steve and make sure that you come with all of your questions, the right questions to ask us. And then we'll guide you as to, uh, you know, uh, the good, the bad, ug the ugly of, of property. It's really important that the quality of the information that you supply us mm. will help us give you the quality of the steerage that we can, that we can give you. And, and we are harsh in terms of being truthful. If we think that you're not in a position to do so safely, we'll be that. Yep. We'll just say, look, it's, yep. it's not. You, you just, you're going to be up against it or it's too, it's it's too dangerous. Sometimes people don't like that. Right? But well, know. they don't. Yeah. It's, um, but nonetheless... You know, our role as advisors is to be truthful and to also give people some structured opinions on whether it's safe to proceed or not. Mm. You know, because there's always a time. Go away, save more, get better serviceability, whatever it may be. So please make sure that the quality of information is good. And as Vic said, you'll actually get down, uh, get to a point in time where you'll sit with either Vic or myself. Uh, and as one parting comment, please do us a favour if you've got some value out of these podcasts give us a like that's facebook isn't it so don't give us a like on spotify give us a rating give us a rating on on itunes spotify and all the other platforms that it's on share it uh, around also make sure that you tune into our facebook lives uh, as vic said all across the other socials that we're on um, we try to be as engaging as we can and that's the end of that vic the next episode will be with phil tarrant mm -hmm. Uh, editor at large of Smart Property Investment Magazine. Everybody have a safe week. Hopefully you got something out of this and we will talk soon. See you soon. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.